Welcome to the Crime Redefined podcast produced by Zero Cliff Media. Coming to you from the U.S. Bank Tower, high above downtown Los Angeles. In our podcast, we drill deep into forensics and criminal investigation from the viewpoint of the defense, as well as explore the intersection of the media and the justice system. Hey, Crime Redefined fans. I'm Dion Mitchell, and with me is my co-host, Mayhol Angeria. On this episode of Crime Redefined, we are joined by Lindsay Wade, who retired from the Tacoma Police Department as a cold case detective in 2018 after an illustrious 21-year career. Pretty cool, huh, Mayhol? Yeah, but, you know, she didn't really retire. That's Uh, true. Yeah. As soon as she uh, was done with Tacoma Police Department, she immediately started writing a book. And she also began working with the Washington State Attorney General's Office. And she was working on their sexual assault kit initiative. And that's because it's, it's pretty clear that her passion is using DNA to solve cold cases. And as a matter of fact, she was instrumental in the 2019 passage of the so-called Jennifer and Michelle's Law which served to expand the types of samples that could be placed into the DNA database, a.k.a. CODIS. That's right. And I guess I'm always impressed when I hear 21 years at anything. Yeah, it's true. It sounds like a part of her uh, retirement is uh, she has a new book that's going to be available soon. And it will be a glimpse into the mind of a brilliant detective and her persistence in solving the most difficult and hideous uh, crimes. Her signature case, if you will, is the disturbing sexual assault and murder of Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian in 1986 in Tacoma, Washington. They were only 12 and 13 years old, respectively. And at the time, Lindsay Wade was just 11 years old. This is a uh, disturbing and fascinating case. And it's very cool how it got solved eventually with DNA technology. So, We're going to talk about the case with Lindsay, of course, but we're not going to necessarily go through the nuts and bolts of it. So I would recommend listeners that after this episode, check out the Dateline episode entitled Evil Was Watching. And it's all about this case. I think it was from 2019. Lindsay's in it. And so you could actually go to Lindsay's website, which is lindsaywade.org, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, W-A-D-E, that's lindsaywade.org, and she has a link to the full episode. And also on her site, um, you can see her appearance on On the Case with Paula Zahn, and she's been on a number of news stories as well. You know, her work uh, was really familiar to me, not necessarily her work, but the case that she was involved with, uh, involved in. Um, having lived in the Northwest for a number of years myself, I'm particularly interested in hearing about Lindsay's thoughts on Ted Bundy yeah. and how she tracked down his DNA. Um, I'm sure that's going to be fascinating. Um, as you will hear, Lindsay has been at the forefront of DNA technology using many of the techniques we have discussed on pra- past uh, crime redefined episodes. Yeah, it's definitely going to be this interview will be a good rehash of some of the themes we've uh, hit on in the past. But well, it's, it's you, like real world application type stuff. You right. Know, so, hey, here's a you know, 21 years career. Here's a person who's on the forefront. You know, the things that we we're talking about. Boom. Here they are using it. Here's right. Using this, it. this is how it's used in the field. And, you know, a lot of those lines, we haven't really talked to many detectives on this podcast. So it's going to be, you know, really cool to hear Lindsay's take on how the system works, how it doesn't work, and how how she does her job and what her part in this this whole system is. So I really think that, you know, whether listeners, you're a criminal justice practitioner, uh, or maybe you're just a fan of true crime and want to know how things are are really done, you know, how how investigations are conducted, how DNA and other science is used. I mean, I think you're really going to enjoy this interview and learn a lot from it. So let's get to it. Hey, Lindsay, welcome to Crime Redefined today. Thanks for having me. Mahal and I are excited to speak with you and hear about your interesting cases and amazing career. Yes, well, um, it's been interesting <laughs> to say the least, but uh, <laughs> absolutely. Well, Lindsay, let's kind of go, go way back. Um, take us back to 1986 when you first heard about the murders of Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian, what kind of effect did that have on you personally when you were a young girl? And, you know, what kind of effect did that have on the community? You know, these terrible murders. 
Well, um, you know, I was a young girl, you know, elementary school, I think I was 11 at, at the time. And so, um, you know, it was pretty shocking and uh, it was, it was pretty terrifying for kids and adults. Um, it really had a, a, a pretty um, significant impact on the community, not just, you know, the, the city of Tacoma, but kind of the surrounding uh, communities as well. Um, and it lasted a very long time. Um, the, you know, the cases went unsolved for over 30 years. So they uh, really, you know, became almost like urban legend in this area. Um, and, you know, most people that have lived here uh, for any length of time, you know, knew something about the cases or, you know, had heard about them. And, you know, everybody kind of had their own take on, you know, what kind of an effect the cases had on them personally. Tell us about the, what were the big factors in those two cases that led everyone to believe that they must have been committed by the same perpetrator? So I'm curious to know what the factors were in those two cases that led everybody to believe that they must have been committed by the same perpetrator. So unfortunately, I can't talk about the Michelle Welch case at this point. Um, I've you know, agreed with the prosecutors that I won't do any interviews on that case until it's resolved. Um, that offender is awaiting trial. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys can piece together the information that's already out there in the media about you know why we thought the cases were related. Um, but I just I can't speak about her case at this point. No problem. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And we'll come back to that case a little bit, you know, in in general terms. But I want to pick up, Lindsay, on your trajectory towards a career in law enforcement. Tell us a little bit about where you were in life when you first picked up The Stranger Beside Me by Ann Rule. And, you know, what drew you to that book? Uh, What did you take from that? And, you know, what did that book mean to you? Well, I was in high school and, um, you know, when I read that book, it 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 definitely uh, kind of set me on my path towards becoming a police officer and eventually a detective. Um, you know, that book really scared the shit out of me, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, I, it, it was just unbelievable. And the fact that it, you know, a lot of it happened near where I lived and, you know, that Ted Bundy was from Tacoma and, you know, just all, all these uh, things were just so fascinating to me. And, you know, that was the first time that I really uh, read about, you know, police investigations. And um, I was just absolutely fascinated. And not only was I fascinated with the investigative part, uh, you know, it also just absolutely floored me that, you know, that somebody like him could be so successful and, you know, operate for as long as he did. And, um, you know, that he just pulled the wool over everyone's eyes and, you know, people just absolutely could not believe that he would be capable of the crimes that he committed. And, and so, I, you know, I just think there were so many different elements about that book that stuck with me. Um, and really, you know, from, from that point on, I, I just kind of knew that, you know, that's what I wanted to do with my life was, you know, be a detective. Yeah. Let me build, build on that a little bit. Tell us about your career in law enforcement. But what were your first impressions of the job while you're at the academy and then when you first went on patrol? Oh, okay. So the police academy was, you know, that's your first stop. And so that was uh, at that time a three month um, period. And, you know, really the police academy is like drinking from a fire hose. I mean, you're trying to learn everything. You're trying to learn laws and you're trying to learn, you know, criminal procedure and how to do traffic stops and how to, you know, how to handcuff somebody. And, um, you know, there's just so much that, um, you know, when you get out of the academy and I mean, I, I can clearly remember my first day on the street and, you know, just I was 22 years old by that point. Um, and I just I just remember thinking this is crazy. Like, I I mean, I really have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I mean, honestly, nobody does when they come out of the academy, uh, you know, and that's why you have a training officer and, you know, you, you ride with a training officer for several months before you're on your own. And, you know, even then, I, I mean, I think for most officers, you know, it takes several years um, before you really 
you know, feel confident in yourself and your abilities, you know, to handle pretty much any situation that gets thrown at you. I mean, when you think about most jobs, you know, you have kind of a set parameter and set parameters of what your duties are. Right. But when you're a police officer, I mean, it's like anything goes. I mean, you know, your day is not dictated by you. You have no control over what what happens. And you're expected to be an expert in about 100 different things. And so uh, it, it's it's challenging. Um, and it's, you know, it's an exciting job. It's, it's a job like no other, I would say. Um, but, you know, I did enjoy my time as a patrol officer. I spent about five years in patrol and um, then made a, a short transfer to narcotics. I spent about a year there. Um, and I was on the detectives list when I was in narcotics. And so uh, I ended up getting promoted uh, a little after a year of being there uh, to detective. Did that, did that um, t- switch to narcotics? Was that something you wanted to do or it just came organically? It was something I wanted to do. I knew it was a good stepping stone uh, for becoming a detective. Which uh, is what that was your, obviously your end game, right? Mm-hmm. I have a quick follow-up question. You mentioned the academy is um, was your training there was three months, correct? Yes. Is that something just that you feel having gone through it that should be longer? You know, four months, five months, six months. Or it was is that longer enough? now. It's it is? actually six months currently. Oh, great. Uh, but you know, when I went through, it was three months. So I want to go back to uh, Ted Bundy. So once you became a detective, um, I understand that you were interested in getting Ted Bundy's. DNA profile into CODIS. Could you walk us through a little bit about how you went about doing that and what some of the roadblocks were? Sure. Um, so in 2011, I was uh, working with my then partner, Gene Miller, and he was the cold case detective for our agency at that time. And we had been discussing the Anne Marie Burke case, which is uh, the oldest cold case. Uh, in Tacoma. Uh, It happened in 1961. And, you know, a lot of people have believed over the years that perhaps Anne Rule, or I'm sorry, not Anne Rule, um, (laughs) Anne Marie Burr might be, you know, Ted Bundy's first victim. And so, you know, we we knew that. um, But at the same time, there was really nothing in the case that linked him to the crime. Um, and so kind of er- during our early discussions about the case, you know, we started talking about suspects and of course, Bundy's name came up and, and I started, you know, kind of wondering, well, you know, if in fact we do have any testable evidence in this case, are we going to have anybody to compare it to? And so that kind of started me on my journey of researching Bundy and, you know, striking out all over the place when I was searching for his DNA. And, um, you know, it wasn't in Washington. Um, I couldn't find it at the medical examiner's office where he was executed and um, finally ended up getting in contact with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab and talking to their um, CODIS manager. And, you know, he and I just sort of put our heads together because, you know, he had been asked the same question um, multiple times. And, you know, the answer was always no, you know, we don't have it. And so, um, you know, we kind of brainstormed and thought about, well, you know, how could we find his DNA? And so I kind of went on my journey uh, in Washington, tracking down leads, um, which, you know, ultimately led me to Ann Rule. And, um, you know, she was able to provide me with some letters and envelopes um, from letters that he had written to her when he was in jail and prison. And um, so I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a possibility I could get his DNA from the stamps um, on the letters. And so that was kind of one avenue of investigation. And then uh, David Kaufman, uh, the CODIS manager down in Florida, he kind of went on his own path. And so I guess they have kind of a Bundy museum at the crime lab down there. And so uh, he uh, looked at some items that were in the lab, um, but, you know, couldn't get a usable profile. And so 
he kept, you know, continued on with his search and he actually ended up finding, um, I think it was two blood vials in the, I believe it was the Columbia County clerk's office. And these vials had been collected from Bundy in 1978, um, shortly after he was arrested. And, you know, the, the, vial, the blood itself, the liquid blood was no good. It was, you know, completely um, putrefied. Oh, wow. Uh, luckily, there was dried blood on the lid of the, the, the vials. And so he was able to, um, his lab was able to generate a full profile from that and get it uploaded into Florida's DNA database, which was a great start. But then that's, you know, I was told that's where it was going to stay because Bundy didn't meet the criteria to go into the national database. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, After all that. Yeah. Like, oh, that, I mean, it's great that he's going into Florida, <laughs> but I mean, right. he's suspected of murders all, across the country. How can his DNA only reside in Florida's database? That makes no sense. And so there was um, conversation that took place with the Indus custodian, um, the, you know, the FBI uh, to try to figure out how to rectify the situation. And eventually it was decided that he would go into national um, in the legal index. And so that's where he sits currently. And so now his profile, you know, can be searched against um, profiles from, you know, all the other state databases as well. That's a good segue to my next question. And besides the, the case that you just mentioned, are there other murders you're convinced Bundy is responsible for? And if so, which ones? I can't say I'm convinced of any because I, you know, there are none that it's just like, oh, for sure. There's so much evidence overwhelmingly. It's him. Um, I, not none that I know of. I know that there are, you know, certainly cases that people suspect him of. And I have no doubt that he's committed way more murders than we know about. Um, you know, he confessed to 30 right before he was executed. And 11 of those were in Washington, but only eight of those victims have been identified. So, I mean, we know he committed more murders, um, but, you know, I don't know, you know, if we'll ever link him to those cases. I hope, I hope that at some point he is linked by, um, you know, scientific methods. But at this point, um, you know, there are, it's hard to say. Yeah, was, that was my next question is what do you think, just personally, what do you think his real number is? I don't know. Um you know, I've heard all the, you know, triple digit stuff. And I mean, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. I mean, it is strange um, that he would have, you know, started his killing career in his 20s. It seems, um, you know, pretty late for somebody like him to have started killing. Right. Um, but I, yeah, I just don't think that we'll ever know. Well, I know we'll never know his, his true number. Um, but I think it's, you know, far more than 30. <laughs> well, Lindsay, in researching your career, um, I learned about, I think for the first time, the phenomenon of these so-called civil commitment centers, uh, such as the one on McNeil Island in Puget Sound. And I actually had never heard of this concept before. Can you explain to our listeners a little bit about the history of these centers, what their purpose is, and then you know, moving into what your specific interest was uh, with regards to them and collecting DNA? Sure. Uh, so there are 22 states in, in the United States that have civil commitment laws. And what that means is an offender who is deemed to be a sexually violent predator can be detained civilly uh, for an indeterminate amount of time after they serve their prison sentence. So basically, the state deems them too dangerous to be released out into the community when they're done with prison. And so instead of being released, they get detained um, and then they go through a trial. Um, and then, well, you know, if they're, if they are found to meet the definition of being a sexually violent predator, then they are detained at this facility. And so in Washington, we have um, a place called the Special Commitment Center and it's um, on McNeil Island and, offenders who are found to be sexually violent predators and those who are pending trial. So um, those that are just detained waiting to be um, tried for this 
can be held out there and it's a secured facility, you know, they can't leave. Um, so, you know, since the program started, I believe they've had well over 400 uh, sexually violent predators that have gone through the island. Um, the program started in 1990, I believe, uh, here in Washington. And back again, 2011, it was my year, I guess. <laughs> 2011, I was working on a cold case and I it was in contact with Department of Corrections on a pr pretty regular basis because, you know, I would get records from them on different things. And um, I started asking some questions about the Special Commitment Center and specifically about, you know, whether or not all the predator, sex predators on the island had their DNA in CODIS. And I never really, you know, got an answer initially. And once they did some research, they figured out that actually, no, the answer is no. Um, a lot of the offenders out there had never had their DNA collected. So I was, it ended up being over 40 um, people out there who, who had not had their DNA collected. And so that was a, you know, a well over a year, um, probably closer to two year long project working with uh, the Special Commitment Center staff and the State Patrol Crime Lab um, to get those individuals DNA collected. And then, you know, there was one person who refused and so we had to take them to court. Um, and so it, it took a while, but eventually all the samples were collected from these guys and some of them had been out there since the 90s um, and probably would never be released, you know, because of their history. And so once all the samples were collected and uploaded into CODIS, um, they ended up actually getting a hit uh, on one of the guys. And his name was Michael Halbrin. And he, he was, um, I think he had been out at the Special Commitment Center since 2001. And he, and he had come there from prison. And he hit to a 1980 uh, murder case and uh, of a like a 19 year old uh, woman in Bellevue, Washington, which is a city north of Tacoma. And so that was really exciting um, because I, I mean, I really thought, oh gosh, you know, that we're going to, like, there's going to be some CODIS hits out of this for sure. These guys are the worst of the worst in Washington. And, you know, sure enough, one of them hit to this, this murder case. And um, when I spoke to the detective, who was investigating that case, he had been investigating that case for 12 years, had wow. collected, you know, dozens of DNA samples from suspects and, you know, never made any headway on the case. And then one day he comes into work and he's got this crime lab report in his box that says there's a hit on this cold case, you know, and he had no idea um, why the hit came in. And so when I called him up and told him about the the project, you know, he was he was pretty excited. I can't imagine what that feeling must be like as uh, you know, if you're working a cold case, like and all of a sudden you're like you said, you've been, you know, putting in the time and energy in, and then he walks in and then like boom, it's laying on his desk. Yeah, yeah. And a name that he had never heard before. I mean, he was not in the case file. He wasn't, you know, a person of interest. And so, you know, it, it was it was a shock. Um but, you know, it was it was just amazing. Um, and he was he was kind enough to let me go with him to make the arrest out on the island and bring the guy back um, to be booked in for the murder. I, I guess, however, it gets done. Right. It, yeah. No matter how you get there, as long as you get there. Right. Yes, exactly. You know, going back to the uh, Michelle and Welch and the Jennifer Bastion cases, and it seems like you were really on the forefront of, of a lot of this tech, DNA technology. There was such an interesting use of everything new in DNA techniques, such as early genetic genealogy, DNA phenotyping, and of course, more advanced genetic genealogy. When you mm -hmm. were a detective, how, how, did that, how is it that you became aware of these tools and that you stayed on top of all of them, especially since they were kind of like growing really by the day? Right. Um, I just, I made it a point to really try to stay on top of anything. Um, any kind of forensic technology. Um, I've always been really interested in DNA. 
And uh, so I just kind of made it my mission to um, build relationships with people that are much smarter than me. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's like, I, you know, just sort of have created this network of people that I really was able to learn from over the years and ask a ton of questions, uh, whether it was, you know, with uh, somebody from the crime lab or, um, you know, forensic anthropologist, or, um, you know, I've got a good friend who's a, you know, a DNA expert. And so it's, you know, it's been helpful to cultivate those relationships and then, you know, stay on top of it by going to trainings and um, talking with detectives. And really, you know, that's how I first learned about um, genetic genealogy was um, talking to a, a detective uh, in Phoenix who, um, you know, told me about the, the canal murders and um, the surname search that Colleen Fitzpatrick had done. And, and that was in 2015. And, you know, when I heard that, I was like, oh, <laughs> I got to do this. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, that's what led to um, the arrest. And then the Jennifer Bastion case, of course, was that surname. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, one of the, the surnames that Colleen had provided me was Washburn. And that turned out to be, you know, my suspect's last name. So, um, you know, just it's 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 amazing how fast just from 2015 to 20 you know well even yeah to now to 2021 how quickly the technology has changed and um, the advances you know between I mean I I thought MBAC was like you know the next coming of Christ <laughs> <laughs> and then you know all of a sudden you know now there's genetic genealogy and you know that you know right, it's, right. It's, it's been one thing after the other and uh, it's just such an exciting time for anyone working cold cases because, I mean, I can remember for years, I, there are so many cases that I worked on for years. And I mean, I, and I mean, I spent hundreds of hours on these cases. I submitted, you know, dozens and dozens of pieces of evidence to the crime lab to the point where I'm sure the lab was so tired of me calling um, and never made a dent, you know, never advanced the cases forward. And it was so frustrating. And, um, you know, as a cold case detective, that's the majority of your day. That's the majority of your week and your month and your year is it's like swimming upstream. And so when this new technology came along, at least for those cases where there is DNA, it's just, it's been a game changer, as you know. Um, these cases that were previously thought to be unsolvable, you know, now, um, you know, you can get answers. Uh, it's, it doesn't help for those cases where you don't have DNA. and I would say most cold cases do not have DNA. Um, so it's it's still really hard for those um, families that are waiting for answers. And they, you know, their case doesn't have, you know, can't be worked with genetic genealogy or, you know, people think it's kind of like a, a slot machine or like the magic button, but right. <laughs> it really isn't. Um, you know, those, those cases are few and far between. And so, um, but, you know, I think that, Right now, um, there seems to be such a great interest in the in the public with um, cold cases, and so I think that's really great because I'm you know I think that's going to help um, kind of keep that energy going and help um, kind of keep the momentum. And you know, a lot of agencies don't have resources and they don't have people to work their cold cases, and so they just are you know they're languishing. Um, they're sitting on a shelf collecting dust. And so I, I think that because of all the interest um, that's out there, you know, I think that it will help to um, drive the people take a look at it again. Yeah. And, and to, you know, also hopefully have these agencies put some resources towards it. Right. Um, but yeah. You must really think uh, like the, for the cases where there is DNA, you must look back and go, my God, what were we doing before these technologies were here? I mean, you were literally feeling around in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that'd be a, a question. Did this make you, because of you were really staying on top of this within the department, did this kind of make you use kind of a baseball term, like a closer, which did like, or like a rock star? Everybody that had a DNA in their case, were they all coming to you for your, for your help and for your input? Not really. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I mean, people would ask me questions, but um, 
I, no, I don't think so. Um, it, 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 it wasn't that way. Although now working at the attorney general's office, um, you know, of course now I have access to cases statewide. And so, you know, I've, I've done some case reviews for other agencies and, you know, looked at their cold cases. And so, you know, I am able to kind of utilize those skills and, and to help people, you know, other than just um, Tacoma cases, but cases all around the state of Washington, which has been nice. Well, Lindsay, other than the the almighty gold standard that DNA is, what would you say is the most the the next most powerful tool that you would have as a cold case detective? Time. Ah. Yeah, I mean, you have time, and you know, relationships change, um, and you know, those that person that might not have wanted to talk. 20 years ago, because of a relationship they had, that relationship may no longer be in existence. So, um, or, you know, their, their life has changed. And, and so they, you know, they just feel differently about the situation. So I think time is um, a benefit and it's something that can help with cold cases. Um, and the fact that you have time as a detective, you know, when you're working a fresh murder case, you you're on the clock, you're, you know, the clock is ticking. There's a lot of pressure to solve the case quickly, but with a cold case, you, you don't have that pressure. You have time to sit back and focus and come up with a game plan and look at the case from different angles. Um, and that's not a luxury that you have with a fresh case. Yeah, and then I suppose another emerging tool is, is is actually the media and podcasts. You know, just kind of waking people up to getting interested in it, and maybe people are crawling out of the woodwork. And we hear how that is now invigorating a lot of these investigations. It's almost like a a crowdsourcing approach to it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, people are interested, and you know, they're talking about these cases, and they're you know, you've got the web sleuth community, and you know, people doing their own research, and um, you know, it's, there's just, it's, it's a lot more visible than it used to be. Yeah. You've just got a lot of eyeballs, uh, you know, looking at these cases now. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the time period around your retirement from Tacoma PD. What was the status of the Bastion Welch investigation? And then kind of walk us through the case breakthrough that happened shortly after your retirement. To the extent that you can. Yep. Yeah. So I, um, in, you know, 20, Kind of the beginning of 2018, I had been a- approached um, by the attorney general's office um, about a grant that they had received and um, this position that was going to be coming available as an investigator working on the, the statewide sexual assault kit initiative. And, you know, at that point, I, um, you know, I gave it a lot of thought and, you know, I decided that I was ready to make a change and do something different. And, you know, to be to retire from law enforcement. And, you know, by that point, I'd been on for 21 years. And um, so I decided that I was going to go ahead and do it. And I had been, you know, in the years, a couple of years prior to that, doing a ton of work on um, those cases and it collected about 160 DNA samples from um you know, potential suspects. And those cases, you know, those samples were being sent off to the lab in small batches um, for testing. And so January of 2018, I had sent off the last batch of samples to the crime lab, knowing full well, you know, it'd be a few months before they, the results came back. But I really, I mean, I had no hope at that point that, you know, any of them were gonna result in a hit. Um, you know, all of the ones, in my mind that I thought looked really good had already come back, not a match. And so, you know, when I left, I had kind of this to-do list of, you know, all these, these different things that were pending at the lab that I had handed off to my um, coworker that took over for me. And it, it just, you know, I was, I was sad in a, in a sense to be leaving and, And really that, you know, one of the hardest thing was, was telling um, Jennifer Bastian's mom that I was leaving um, because we had become really close. And, you know, she knew that I had put a lot of time into working on um, her daughter's case. So that was one of the hardest things. Um, But, 
you know, I kind of in the back of my mind was thinking, well, I'm going to be doing all this work with DNA um, for the attorney general's office. And so, you know, I think there's still hope that at some point, you know, these cases will still be solved. You know, maybe it'll be as a result of, um, you know, the sexual assault kit testing, who knows? So that was sort of, you know, that was it for me. I mean, I left, um, retired uh, in April of 2018 and went to work for the attorney general's office. And it was less than a month later. I think it was like 25 days later. Um, I get a call from uh, the detective who replaced me in the cold case unit telling me that he had gotten a hit on the Jennifer Bastion case. And it was, um, you know, one of the last, one of the guys that was in that last batch of samples that I had submitted in January. And so, you know, it was, it was overwhelming. Um, it was. <laughs> Can I ask where you were at when you got the call? What, what were you doing? Well, can I, do you mind if I ask what, where were you at or what you were doing when you got the call? Yeah, I was at home. I was working from home. And, um, you know, when he called me, you know, I just, I, I couldn't even respond initially. I was just so overwhelmed. And then, you know, I asked him who, you know, what's the name? Who, who is it? And he told me, and then, um, I, you know, I, re I knew exactly who it was you know, when he told me the name Washburn, but um, you know, Washburn, he wasn't really, he didn't look like a, a really good suspect uh, on paper. He, the only reason that I had even included him in my list of people to get uh, samples from was because of his last name. Um, but, you know, everybody else that I had collected from at that point were, were people that I had kind of deemed higher priority based on, you know, their criminal history, um, mainly. And this guy, you know, he really didn't have anything. Uh, that stood out at all. And um, he really was only, you know, collected from because of his last name. So anyway, it was, it was just overwhelming. Um, and even more difficult was that um, I had to wait two days to tell Patty Bastion about the hit, because of course, we wanted to keep it under wraps until he was in custody. And he was out of state. And so um, detectives had to fly to Illinois to arrest him. And then as soon as he was in custody, then I got to go knock on Patty's door and tell her the news. Um, and so that was pretty, it, it was the best day of my career, without a doubt, hands down. <laughs> you know, and I guess along those lines, Lindsay, you probably never can truly retire because this is going to continue to happen. The cases that you worked on 20, 30 years ago, whatever, they're going to continue to get solved and suck you right back in. And, and I'm sure along those lines, you've built other relationships with family members and it just would imagine is going to stay a part of you for the rest of your days. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, it's hard um, because, you know, this, the cases, I think, I, I think more about the cases that I didn't solve mm -hmm. than the cases that I, that I did solve. And, you know, this, this cases haunt me. I mean, they keep me up at night because, you know, as a detective, I mean, you take those cases personally. And, um, you know, you, you do build a relationship with family members and, but you also, you know, have, um, just a personal stake in, in the case. And so it is hard. Um, and you know, for you ask any homicide detective and w when they retire, you know, the hardest thing for them to do when they retire is to have any open cases left because it's just, you know, you feel like you just didn't do your job. Well, kind of continuing with the, the more personal questions, um, I read a fantastic blog post on your website entitled I Am Me. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write that and what its meaning is, particularly through the lens of today, you know, with the tough times for race relations and, of course, police community relations? Yeah, you know, I mean, I um, when I wrote that, it was, you know, kind of, I think maybe it was right after... Uh, George Floyd, but, you know, things had just become um, just so polarizing. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm sort of stuck in the middle, um, you know, because I am a black female, but I'm also, you know, a former police officer, you know, my husband's a police officer. Um, and, 
you know, it's, I, I, I understand both sides. And so I, I, you know, sometimes feel like I'm sort of stuck um, in the middle. And so that's, that's kind of where that um, poem came from is, is, you know, I just had all these thoughts and all these feelings. And, you know, for me, the way that I like to express my feelings is to write things. And so, um, you know, that's, that's where that came from. I guess that's kind of a good segue. I want to wish you congratulations. I understand that you're a new author. Yes. So I, um, I started writing uh, my book shortly after I retired. And um, at this point, um, just working with my, my agent uh, on, a, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to get it published. So it's been a very long road. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know nothing about, you know, the publishing industry or the literary world. And so it's been um, a huge learning curve for me. Uh, you know, I'm used to writing police reports where it's like who, when, what, where, you know, why and how, and that's it. You you don't add your, your um, opinion uh, and you don't add your feelings for sure. And so uh, writing a book that somebody wants to read um, is quite different than, you know, the, the style of writing that I'm used to. So it's been uh, challenging, but also a, a lot of fun um, to be able to actually, you know, get my thoughts and feelings down on paper and, and to share, you know, some of the interesting cases that I worked on um, in my career. That's really interesting. It makes me think, tell us, can you tell me just share with our listeners just a little bit about the process? Because that's a that's a big transition that you just mentioned. So how do you go from reports to basically entertainment? So how did you like, did you carve out a space in your house? And how did you make that transition? So I, um, I think when I was writing the book for most of the time, I literally just, you know, had a desk in my living room and I would um, write after my family went to bed. So I just had, you know, peace and quiet. Um, it, you know, early on, I actually hired a book coach and that was the best thing I could have done because she really helped kind of shape um, the way that I was writing and, and move it from, okay, just, you know, getting all the facts down versus, you know, what did it look like? What did it smell like? What did it feel like? You know, let's add some color. Um, you know, all the things that I was, that, you know, it was like beat into me as a, you know, a police officer, you know, you don't write that stuff. Um, it, I, it just, it took a long time to write it, even though I was used to reading books and I knew what I liked to read, um, it was hard to write it. And so, um, you know, it took, it took, a lot of editing, a lot of back and forth, a lot of track changes um, with my book coach. Uh, you, but she really did help push me um, to add more of that that flavor um, and the you know add the life into the story. And um, and then when I found my agent, um, you know, she also helped me with that considerably. And so, um, you know, that it's been great working with people that are professional writers. And, you know, I am not a professional writer. I am, you know, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a subject matter expert that's writing about my subject matter. And so um, it's been great to have those people that are experts in that, in their craft, um, help me along the way. Well, Lindsay, you've also been a, a very strong and excellent advocate for the expansion of these DNA databases. Can you describe for us a little bit about the work you did in developing, promoting, and eventually executing Jennifer and Michelle's law? Yeah, so um, I worked really closely with um, Washington State Representative Tina Orwall, and she's been a big proponent of um, sexual assault reform and a lot of the legislation that's occurred in Washington since 2015 uh, related to um, sexual assault and, um, you know, victims of sexual assault and really, you know, helping um, survivors get justice. And so I was able to work with her and, you know, gosh, we went, I think, I think it took four years of um, advocating before we finally got that bill passed into law. And it was, it was hard. Um, you know, Patty Bastion was a huge advocate and she would come down to Olympia and testify. Um, I would go down and testify. Uh, and it was finally, you know, in 2019, we finally had enough backing and support to get that law passed. And, um, you know, it was fantastic. You know, it's, 
it's, it's much needed. And I think it's so great to have, you know, something, a law, especially related to DNA, um, you know, in the name of those two girls, because, you know, they should never be forgotten. And um, I Absolutely. think that, you know, DNA is such a powerful tool. And we assume, um, I think a lot of people assume that because the DNA laws have been around for so long, that the system really works and that people's DNA does actually get collected when they go to prison and it gets put into CODIS, but you know, it's, that's not always the case. And so, um, you know, for me, you know, I'm always looking for ways to kind of fix some of the loopholes when it comes to, you know, DNA related laws. You know, I want to take advantage, Lindsay, of our unique opportunity to speak with you and your background. You're such an accomplished detective and I'm really excited to kind of ask this question. Um, walk us through what are the initial steps in a cold case investigation. So uh, a detective picks up a binder on a case and he or she is hoping to rekindle. What are those first steps out of the gate to kind of fire things up? Read the case. Um, you know, the first thing you want to do is, you know, I guess even before you read it is you want to look to make sure you have everything. And, you know, with cold cases, especially, um, you know, you'll find that there might be documents at the prosecutor's office or the crime lab or the medical examiner's office uh, or the property room that are not in the binder. And so it's really important to make sure you have everything to start with and then to read it over and, you know, usually more than once. Um, and I'm a big sticky note component <laughs> or proponent. And so, um, you know, I, for me, I would read through the book first just and then go back um, a second time and read it and make sticky notes and, um, you know, make notes for myself on things that I found interesting, things I wanted to go back to, things I wanted to look into. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of have to figure out where's everybody at? You've got all these people listed in the, in the case. Are they alive? Are they dead? Are they in prison? Did they move to Oklahoma? Um, you know, you got to figure out where these people are and, you know, are you going to be able to locate them? Um, and then, you know, really, really importantly for me, especially since I always kind of, um, focused on the forensic side was what about the evidence, you know, what kind of evidence was collected? Is it still maintained? And, um, what can we do with that evidence today that couldn't, you know, that couldn't have been done when the crime was committed? And so, you know, one of the things that I always find interesting is um, sometimes I'll hear, to, you know, a detective say, well, you know, yeah, they did DNA testing already and they didn't find anything. Okay, well, if they didn't do DNA testing within the last like five years, they need to right. do it, you know? Right, right. So I, I, when people tell me that, I just like, yeah, okay, I'm going to, let's take another look. Um, but you know, and, you know, it's not just DNA. I mean, heck, you know, with next generation fingerprinting, um, they're solving all kinds of cases now with, uh, with that technology, because um, a lot of these fingerprints uh, haven't been looked at in these cases for decades. And so, um, you know, that's really been a game changer for, for some of these cold cases. Um, but I think it's, you know, just important to look at everything, you know, uh, and because with cold cases, you weren't there, you weren't part of the investigation originally, you know, it's important to go back to the crime scene. It's important to talk to everybody. And, you know, in some cases, you know, I'll even go back and talk to the medical examiner um, and have him really explain to me, like, how did you come up with this, you know, or, or how did the medical examiner from that time come up with this determination because I don't really understand it. Um, I think the biggest mistake that a detective can make is not asking questions. And I, I think sometimes people um, hesitate to ask questions because they feel like it you know, might undermine them somehow or you know, make it seem like they don't know what they're doing. Um, but I think it's the complete opposite. Uh, you, gotta, you, know, you gotta ask questions and keep asking questions um, because that's how you learn. Well, interestingly, in some of the missing persons cases, um, it seems like at least on rare occasion, the individual is actually missing on purpose. 
And I think there's a term like runner or ghosting or, or something like that. It, when you have that type of situation, what are some of the telltale signs that someone who is labeled as a missing person actually intended to fall off the grid and disappear? Um, gosh, you know, I, I mean, I had a few cases where, you know, someone intentionally uh, took off and actually committed suicide, mm. uh, but they just were, you know, kind of um, identified as a missing person for a long period of time until they were found. Um, I can't say that I've had any experience with somebody that just decided like, I'm going to start a new life and go move to, you know, some other place and change my identity. Um, so I haven't dealt with that myself, but, um, I mean, it certainly happens. So it truly, truly is a rare phenomenon then. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I did, I, I worked missing persons for quite a few years and, um, I, I mean, I can't say that I ever came across that. There were definitely people that got reported missing who, I mean, they weren't intending to like hide from people, but they just, you know, they lived a lifestyle that didn't really lend Needed a break from themselves a little bit and from their situation. Yeah. Like they just, you know, sometimes people don't keep in contact with their relatives or their, or their, you know, their loved ones uh, because of their lifestyle, especially if they're living a high risk lifestyle um, or, you know, if they're in a relationship that doesn't allow for that. So, um, you know, there's certainly are times when people get reported missing, but, um, you know, they just, they're fine, you know, once, once they're, they're located, but they just intentionally weren't keeping in contact. But you, but you think it's a kind of a rare, like if someone, you know, ghosting themselves, you think it's actually pretty rare. I have not seen that personally. Wow. So we'll, I guess we'll start to wrap it up a little bit. And it's only fair that we, uh, ask you to tell us about your your podcast and to talk about the uh your cold case uh podcast yeah so um we we haven't recorded a new episode in in quite a while but um i started the podcast with a, a friend of mine named mike mccann who um is also working on a book about um ted bundy and so we decided to kind of focus on um cold cases, both solved and unsolved, and to, you know, try to focus on, um, you know, interviewing some of the experts within the field. So, you know, we interviewed Colleen Fitzpatrick in one episode, and um, we interviewed our state forensic anthropologist. And, you know, we just thought the listeners, aside from just, you know, telling stories about cases, would be interested to hear from, you know, some of the the really uh, phenomenal people that do the work, um, oftentimes behind the scenes on some of these cases. Well, uh, we enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed listening to it. Um, where can they, where can people find it at? Where can our listeners find it at? Um, so it's the podcast is called anatomy of a cold case and it's on um, Apple, um, see Spotify, um, anchor. And um, I don't know, wherever you find your podcasts, I think it's on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's, an, that's enough. I think you yeah. hit the big ones. <laughs> Well, Lindsay, uh, we learned a lot today. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yes. Well, thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you bet. And, you know, best of luck to you with the book and, you know, whatever, it el whatever else it is you decide to conquer. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Well, Dion, I get the feeling that now that Ted Bundy's DNA is in the database, that eventually he's going to be linked, you know, with DNA to many more cases. And obviously the, the evidence is quite old in those cases from the seventies, um, but people aren't gonna lose interest in them. And if some of that ep, uh, evidence still exists, you know, now that the DNA testing methods are improving, there's gonna be a greater and greater chance that they can get usable DNA. And there's just bound to be more hits. And, you know, I wanted to touch on something. I wanna get technical here just for a minute, but, Lindsay was talking about how it was very hard to get a sample of, of Ted Bundy's DNA. And eventually they found this vial of blood in the court clerk's office. Well, guess what? If it's at the court clerk's office, it's not refrigerated, obviously. So as she said, you know, the DNA was all, the liquid blood was no good. It was all putrefied, but there was dried blood still somewhere on that vial. And that gave a full profile. So 
you know, dried blood stains, even if they're stored at room temperature or even worse, they're going to give you DNA for years and years and years. And this is precisely why this is the preferred method of storing DNA from blood is, you know, you, you put it onto a card, you make a dried stain and right. you freeze it. Right. So Dion, did you get your Ted Bundy questions answered? Uh, yes, no, and maybe. Okay. And one, um, I tried it a couple of times to get her to bite on a couple of questions, but she, uh, being a smart detective, wouldn't right. bite on those. She's she still, she's still a detective after all. She, she, she is. Um, one quick comment, um, is that I found it her, her, her comment was interesting about the, I hate to call it a shrine, but the, the Florida, the Florida, um, was it Dade County? Uh, oh, the, the, the Ted Bundy Museum? Yeah, the museum. Yeah, they, had right. a, they actually had like a sign or a, sh a shrine or a museum set up for them because there was so much material, which goes to actually my comment. One of the questions I, I couldn't get her to bite on is what's his real number? I mean, I was having, right. I don't think it's 30 or whatever she mentioned it, it was. I think it's a lot more. I was having deja vu visions of H.H. H. Holmes that I think that there's no incentive for Ted Bundy to give any kind of a real number, but I, I would guess it's at, at least well over 50. You can't be doing what he was doing for that long across the United States in that time period without DNA and these other forensic techniques and have the number, you know, be, in my opinion, unfortunately that, that low, I think it's a lot more. I think yeah. And it will be linked to him. Right. Years. Yeah. And as a serial killer, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to deceive the cops. So when you get caught, you know, I don't think that ends, you know, you're still going to toy with them. Oh, was it 30 people? Was it a hundred? Well, look, we're still, it's, it makes his legacy live on. We're still talking about him, right? You know what? Dummies like us are still talking about it. That's I mean, right. We, we, we took, They're still making movies about it. I mean, come on. Bait. We had yeah. the last laugh, you know? Yeah, right, right, Ex exactly. But, uh, you know, she was very dogged with DNA in all her cases, you know, historical ones, Ted Bundy, and current ones. And it, it was really great to see a detective who was so up to date on the latest DNA trends. And she gave the example when she, you know, would when she cracks open a cold case, first thing to do is go talk to the people who worked it originally. Go talk to the medical examiner. I love that breakdown. That was inside baseball for me. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was. I think the question was, hey, how do you, you know, what do you do to get started on this? And, you know, some of that stuff is logical. Hey, you do this. But right. it, was, it was really cool to hear it right from a, a veteran detective. You, you know, what struck me is that it's essentially the same operation when you're looking at a case post-conviction. Because you're looking at it with the eyes that they did not convict the right person. So it's now a cold case again. So if you're trying to exonerate somebody, it's obviously best to solve the case at the same time. So all these steps she was talking about sounded very familiar to me looking hmm, at cases from a post-conviction posture. So it's kind of funny how the two worlds in, in that regard intersect. But well, you get the same she, goal in mind, you may be on different teams, right? Right. The it's the same. Great. Get the right guy or girl. It's an unsolved case. Any way right. you look at it. Right. So it was kind of, it was what struck me is she was talking about, she went and talked to the detective in this one particular case. He said, oh yeah, yeah, we tried DNA and, you know, it was a dead end. And she asked, well, how long ago? You know, five years. Well, my gosh, that's ancient history now right. in, in right. DNA technology. So there's the Lindsay's out there. Um, but I think the detective that she described, you know, just saying, hey, we did DNA and that's enough. That's probably more reflective of where most law enforcement is actually at. I checked that, I checked that box, right? I, yeah. I checked the DNA box. There's nothing to see here. Let's move along on to something else. You know, something that maybe they, unfortunately, and I don't mean this as a, as a dig, that they understand, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, of course, when DNA was brand new, it was just over everybody's head. And you can't really say that DNA is a new technology, but the way that it's used is constantly right. new. Every right. two years or something, we have these dramatic breakthroughs. So um, I don't know how many Lindsay's there are out there. Well, let's also break that down even further. So let's say there, let's say there's a new DNA technique doesn't come up for a number of years, but let's just stay with uh, genetic genealogy. Yeah, there's going to be more people uploading it. So even on, for that alone, you need to keep going back and tasting it because you may get a familia hit, right? Or a CODIS hit because every year those that database is expanding. Well, it's true. And, and even and I'll kind of uh, run a parallel with attorneys. You know, a lot of attorneys, they might have went 10, 15, 20 years without ever seeing DNA in a case. Part of that is because when DNA was first used, it was 
clunky and expensive. It was only used in the most serious cases. Well, now, I mean, if it's a, you know, somebody was jaywalking and dropped a piece of gum, they, they might use DNA in it. So right. more attorneys, more detectives are going to have to deal with this. It's going to be right in their face. Right. Yeah, it's, I think it's truly incredible how the technologies like ge genetic genealogy are, are closing these cases one after another. Right. So, I mean, there's no doubt that genetic genealogy is, like you say in the baseball parlance, that, that it's the closer. But I think one thing we've got to remember is that although, you know, it looks like genetic genealogy quickly solves a case and maybe easily solves a case, you've got to kind of understand how that sausage is actually made. So, getting the DNA sample um, in a lot of cases might be the easy part. And then just uploading it into this open access genealogy, um, that, that database, that's probably the, the easy part. It's what happens after that to actually get the lead that can be extremely labor intensive. And that's why you can't throw this at every case, even if you have a DNA sample, because it's gonna take months of hard work and probably numerous individuals working together to refine this genealogy research. In other words, to look at documents, track down leads, interview people, maybe perform additional DNA testing. So to get to that magic moment of, of cuffing the perp and say, ah, DNA did it, that takes a lot of time and effort. And, you know, like Lindsay said, um, most of the cold cases don't even have DNA evidence. So we hear about the genetic genealogy, but it's really just a drop in the bucket of the cold cases there, there, and it's not available for most of them. Yeah, unfortunately, there is going to be a little bit of a, I guess, a timestamp cutoff. So everything after this date, DNA will have an impact because they just weren't collecting it or knew to collect it before right, this date, right. right? Unless they, you know, something falls out of the sky and they're able to, to link it to somebody that could be a potential suspect or witness in a case, correct? I mean, if you don't have it, you can't test it. And that's right. Th that's just all there is to it. And a lot of times people, or it was collected maybe in the 80s, but it could have been destroyed. It could have been damaged. Believe it or not, these things get lost. You know, for example, like the, the Ted Bundy blood vial in the, in the clerk's office, it seemed like Lindsay and other people had to go through a lot of work to even locate it. You know, where was the where was the evidence tracking system in the 70s and the 80s? You know, it's was, it was probably written on a cocktail napkin. Yeah, that was a little bit of a jaw drop for me, you know, kind <laughs> yeah. of thinking, okay, you, all that you're right i mean there just should have been that she had to go through that much work and here it was sitting in a, in a lab and right and there was right. A, and there was a shrine you know it just, it just well yeah little... that was one and then then the you know the clerk's office so like you know yeah. like i say before it's like well that you know i mean you're not looking to preserve evidence there it's just that it was probably a court exhibit and you have to hold right. on to that stuff so it was, it was just thrown in a box somewhere well i guess that kind of a uh, a positive side to that that she, that Lindsay raised that it's that time is on the cold case detective side. Yeah. That there's there's no, you know, there's not so much pressure, uh, timing pressure, and that they'll get there when they get there. And then also now departments have dedicated cold case units. This way they're not taking it away from resources from, from current cases, which I thought is also smart. I think you're going to see a lot more of, I guess, compartmentalizing um, in, I think, medium to large forces just for that. Because I think as we keep moving forward with the DNA, um, they're going to be able to really go back and like, like we just talked about and start applying some of this DNA that's sitting on a shelf somewhere to these cold cases. Well, when you think about the amount of material that has to be reviewed on a cold case, um, you really can't be pulled in 25 different directions doing other cases. So these dedicated cold right. units are a great idea because you think about it, a brand new case, there's only so much evidence, so many police reports, only so much has been done. But if you're looking at a cold case, there might be 40 years of people investigating this and researching it and you have to plow through all of that so you really have to be focused on it and it seems to me that you know Lindsay is really really cut out for this job and i suppose to the outside world uh it sounds like she just sort of sailed through her career was continually promoted and excelled but i'm sure dion it wasn't that easy and you know maybe we should have asked her more about some of the challenges that she faced and hopefully we can talk to her again down the road you know particularly when her book comes out. And, you know, even just the fact that in this, you know, in the business she's in, I mean, she's, she's a woman and she's biracial at that. So what challenges must that have brought onto her? And I bet we'll hear about that in her book. Yeah, I hope so. I still go back to how rewarding it must be um, when a detective finally solves a mystery that's, that's decades old, you know, like how yep. cool is it that cases Lindsay worked on for years will likely end up being solved 
in the future and she'll continue to celebrate them. I think that's, I think that's why you get into the business and why she works so hard to become a detective. Well, you know what else? Um, <laughs> the, the, the more complicated these cases are, the, the longer they're going to live on because some of the cases that Lindsay thought were solved are going to come back on appeal. Convictions right. might be overturned. <laughs> and so you never get away from these cases, particularly the, the complicated murder cases. I agree, but I also there's another thing I took away from I, I guess from her her spirit on this is that I, obviously she loves bringing closer to the family. You yep. can tell by that part of the discussion. I don't want to you know go too much in that because it, it just spoke for itself. Right. But I'm sure that she also is always you know spending a lot of time focusing on the cases that she couldn't solve during her career. I bet you that probably really eats her up. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a tough side effect to this line of work. And um, I mean, just to kind of close out here, I think that this interview was a great lesson on how it's not really the DNA technology that solves the case. It's the detective who put the work in. It's the Lindsay's of the world. Yeah. To, first of all, find the DNA and then make sure that it can be compared to as many people as possible. Um, if your suspect's not in a database somewhere, there, there's just not going to be a hit. So, you know, for example, I was really impressed with how Lindsay thought about these civil commitment centers. And, you know, and had the idea that, hey, we don't know that their DNA profiles are necessarily in a database. So she went and wasn't easy, but ended up getting those guys tested. And lo and behold, she solved the case that way. Well, it's that kind of out of the box thinking that right. I think is going to keep the, you know, like, I hate to keep using sports analogies, but the ball, you know, moving down the field, you know, it's like, okay, well, we tried this, we've been doing it this way. How much success? What else can we try? Well said. So we look forward to talking with Lindsay again in the near future. And of course, reading her book. It seems like there's uh, so many questions we could have asked her, but we only had a short amount of time. Um, to learn more about Lindsay, uh, check out her website at lindsaywade.org. And also check her out on Twitter at uh, ELLEW7. That's E-L-L-E-D-U-B-B-7. And we want to say, hey, thanks again for listening and for interacting us with us on uh, social media. Keep those questions coming. We love it. Um, we like to play, you know, stump the DNA expert when we get a ch every chance we get. <laughs> so good luck. Every <laughs> nice. We hope everyone is doing better now that the pandemic is subsiding a little bit. And make sure you check out all of our past episodes at crimeredefined.com. Be well, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Crime Redefined podcast. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Crime Redefined. Please send us your comments and questions and join us for the next episode.